Okay, this is Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterwards, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain amount of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, 
He saw one of them being ill-treated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, man, ye are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was ill-treating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings for 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul approved of their killing him. Thank you, Nile and Alice. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we pray, please, that as we look now at this passage just read to us, you would give us soft hearts and listening ears, that we might not be those who hear your word but don't do it, who receive your word but don't do it, but those who accept what you say and are changed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, they reckon that there was a, a million people who watched it in the flesh, a further 25 million who watched it on their TV screens, and across the globe, millions upon millions who listened to it on the radio. I'm speaking about the launch of Apollo 11 in July 1969. Yeah, that was the rocket. Uh, containing three American astronauts, which launched out of the Earth at Earth's atmosphere and landed on the moon uh, for the first time in human history. It changed the world. And Neil Armstrong was right when he said it was a giant leap for mankind. Well, this morning, as, as you know, we're going to be looking at Stephen's speech. Um, some have criticized it. This is what the, the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw wrote. He doesn't hold back. Stephen is, is a quite intolerable young speaker, a tactless and conceited bore, delivering an oration to the council in which he inflicted on them a tedious sketch of the history of Israel with which they were presumably as well acquainted as he. But that's nonsense, and it is ignorant. Um, because this is a, a speech that changed the world. It, it incited an extreme reaction, um, and like a, a rocket launch, it launched the gospel out of Jerusalem for the first time into Judea and Samaria, and then onwards to the very ends of the earth. This speech is a rocket launch. It is rocket fuel, which went on to change the world. So rather than dismiss it like George Bernard Shaw did, let's give it the attention that it deserves and have a look at this speech. Uh, you may remember from last week, we met Stephen there in Acts 6. He was one of the seven. Luke described him as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And in our passage today, we meet uh, Stephen doing miracles, uh, which some from the, the uh, local synagogues were very opposed to. They started to argue with him, but were told that they couldn't refute his wisdom. So they took it to the next level and resorted to lies and mudslinging and slander, persuading some men to make up accusations against him. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place, that is, the temple, and against the law. And so Stephen is arrested and put on trial. And what we had read to us from chapter 7 is his defense against those accusations. So what does Stephen say? 
in this world-changing speech? Well, it is a thorough defense, um, and he says a lot in there, much more, in fact, than we're, than we're going to have uh, the time to look at in depth uh, this morning. But I want us to look at two particular uh, dominant themes of Stephen's speech in particular, uh, one about God and the second about us. So firstly, Stephen corrects their view of God. At the Sanhedrin and the Jewish uh, leaders, they were obsessed by their temple. As, uh, as you know, we've already mentioned, they, they spoke of it as the holy place. And in fact, their devotion to the temple was even greater than their devotion to God. It, and uh, it actually d diminished their view of God. Uh, they began to see God as somehow contained within that building, local to their city. And so Stephen corrects them, uh, showing them from Israel's history that God doesn't dwell in one particular place, but rather with his people, wherever in the world they may be. So Stephen's history of God's people, it, it reads a bit like a tour guide of the ancient Near East. So I wonder, did you pick up just how many uh, place names are mentioned of where God was with his people long before any brick was laid to build a temple? So Stephen begins with Abraham, their forefather. Uh, the God of glory, verse 2, appeared to our father Abraham. Where was that? While he was still in Mesopotamia. Then, on God's instruction, Abraham leaves there and settles in Haran. Second half of verse 4, Stephen says, After the death of his father, God sent Abraham to this land where you are now living, the land that would become the land of Israel. Stephen then goes on to speak about Isaac and Jacob before majoring on Joseph. What does he say there? Verse 9. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. Uh, and was it just Joseph there by himself in Egypt? No, Stephen says, God was with him there. Then from verse 20, Stephen turns his attention to Moses, who fled from Egypt into Midian. Does God go with him? Yes, he does, appearing to him in the burning bush. After some time, God sent him back to Egypt to lead the people out of slavery, which he does, and he brings them into the wilderness. Uh, does God go with uh, Moses and the people into the wilderness? Yes, he does, speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai before, after many years, they travel through the wilderness, finally coming to the land of Israel, which would become their land. All of this traveling before even one brick of the temple is laid. And the point that Stephen is making to counter what they thought is that God doesn't dwell in any one particular place, but rather with his people, wherever in the world they may be. He is a traveling God. He can't be tied down to one particular place because he has tied himself to his people wherever they are. And in any case, Stephen says, God is too big to be contained in some building. That's the point that Stephen makes when he eventually gets to the story of the temple being built. So when the temple is built, um, in one sense, God moves in, in the sense that his glory comes and fills the place, and he puts his name there, and he dwells there symbolically. And yet, of course, in another sense, of course he doesn't move into the temple. Stephen says this, verse 48, the Most High does not live in houses, 
made by human hands. Stephen points to them what God said through Isaiah. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? Stephen draws their attention to what God says. No building, no matter how big or grand, could ever possibly contain the creator of everything. God isn't confined he isn't constrained. He, he's not a, a genie in a bottle. He's a traveling God. You can't tie him to one particular place because he's tied himself to his people wherever in the world they may be. Now, that's the first uh, major theme of Stephen's speech and Stephen's defense to the Sanhedrin. Let me just think about that a little bit further as it, as it relates to us before we move on to this second major theme. And I think that it teaches us the lesson that there are no holy places. That's very, very clear from Stephen's speech. There are no holy places. God doesn't dwell in one particular place, but with his people. And so an implication of that for us is that we must be very careful in how we think about religious buildings. We must be careful not to think of them as holy places. Now, I don't think we do this here, um, but I do think we need to be aware that sometimes, perhaps even often, Christians do speak about religious buildings and treat them as holy places. I'm not speaking here about looking after the place well. You may be, this morning you may well notice the place is looking fresher than normal. That's a team of men were in yesterday, cleaning up things, fixing things, looking after it. I'm not speaking about looking after the space well. We're grateful to that team who did such a good job. I'm not speaking about being good stewards of a building, making sure that it's used for good and not for evil. But I'm speaking about the attitude that treats a religious building as if it's a holy place, somewhere where God is. So such a person might call this space in here um, the sanctuary, perhaps, or the whole uh, building, God's house. Or they might rope off the area near the communion table because they think of it as a holy space. Other Christians, you may have heard this, speak about thin places. Uh, what they mean by that, typically mountain tops or beauty spots, places where they feel that the boundary between heaven and earth is somehow thinner. Places where they think that God's presence is somehow closer, or where access to Him is, 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 more, is, is easier than in normal places. But I'm afraid from what Stephen has just said in his speech about the temple, there are no such places like that. Though that type of language is unhelpful and unscriptural. There are no holy places. God doesn't dwell in any one particular place. The whole earth is his footstool. And I think for us here at Antrim Baptist Church, I think we, we do know that. I think our history, our nomadic history, certainly helps us with that. Meeting initially in the British Legion, of all places, then on the Greystone Road, in a building which is now demolished, and now in here. I think we learn it from our own history. These, those spaces were not holy places. This space here it is an amazing resource, brilliant resource. We are so grateful to have it, but it's not a holy place. It's no more sacred than your kitchen or your bathroom. Why? Because God doesn't dwell in any one particular place, but rather with his people. So there are no holy places. Second implication, though, is the flip side of that that neither are there any God-free zones. And I think for the early church, uh, listening to Stephen's speech on this particular day, this was so relevant because this was a day 
when they were going to be pushed out of Jerusalem and scattered into Judea and Samaria. We'll think about that next week. No longer would these believers be able to meet together in the temple courts. So as they packed their bags to flee the persecution, would they be leaving God behind? Would they be foregoing God's presence as they waved goodbye to Jerusalem? As they stepped out from that place, would they be going into unfamiliar places alone by themselves? Stephen's speech says, absolutely not, because there are no God-free zones. God doesn't tie himself to any one particular place, but to his people wherever in the world that they go. What an encouragement for this early church to hear this on this particular day. I was reminded this week about St. Patrick bringing the gospel to Ireland um, in the fifth century. Um, Ireland, it was, it was, it was wild. Uh, they talked about it as a place unreachable for the gospel. The people then were drunken, violent, illiterate pagans. But Patrick knew that in coming here, he wouldn't be kind of going alone into some God-free zone, but that God, by his Spirit, would go with him. And that was the thing that gave him courage to come back here with the gospel. You think of his famous prayer, Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, and so on and so on. Because Patrick knew that God doesn't tie himself to any one particular place, but to his people, wherever in the world that they go, even fifth century Ireland. And I think this truth should give us courage likewise to follow in his footsteps, to step out into unfamiliar places with the gospel, whether that's somewhere local or far away, knowing that God will go with us and help us. So that's the first, I guess, the first major theme of this speech about God and where God is. But then secondly, uh, the second major theme of Stephen's speech and defense is about us. Because the history of God's people is also the story of humanity and of our rejection of God's rescuer. I wonder, did you notice just how many times in Israel's history they rejected the person God sent and raised up as their rescuer? So Stephen speaks at length about Joseph, whom God raised up to rescue his people, verse 9 and 10. Joseph was in Egypt. God was with him, rescuing him from all of his troubles, giving him wisdom, enabling him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, such that Pharaoh makes him ruler over Egypt. So that when the famine comes, Joseph is ready there in place. God has put him in the place so that he is able to rescue his family from starvation. Joseph was God's rescuer. But how had his brothers treated him? Verse 9, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. In Joseph, God had raised up a rescuer. God's people had rejected him. And it's the same pattern with Moses. In Egypt, Moses was God's rescuer. When he was born, Stephen says, he was no ordinary child. When he's 40, he defends God's people by killing an abusive Egyptian slave master. We're told, verse 25, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. The Israelites tearing each other apart, and he's pushed aside. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Again, God raises up a rescuer. And God's, and God's people reject him. Moses flees to Midian. God sends him back to rescue his people. 
which he does, bringing them out of slavery into the wilderness. Again, in the wilderness, how do God's people respond to God's rescuer? Verse 39 and 40, they refuse to obey Moses. They reject him and in their hearts turn back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Again, they reject God's rescuer. Same story when it comes to the prophets who spoke about how to be rescued. Stephen says, verse 52, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? Finally then, as the culmination of all of this, God raising up a rescuer, God sends them Jesus to rescue them, the one whom Moses and the prophets had predicted and looked forward to. And Stephen says, verse 51, you've acted just like your ancestors, same pattern, you rejected him, you murdered him. What now for Stephen, the one whom God had sent to point them point out their sin and point them to Christ that they might be rescued, he is going to be stoned to death. So you have this theme time and time and time again. The human heart, we see, naturally rejects God's provision of a rescuer. And for us, I think this is teaching us a lesson to beware our, that tendency of our hearts to beware our heart's natural resistance to God's rescuer. Because the history of God's people is the history of the human heart. What is it that makes our hearts so naturally resistant to God's rescuer? Well, I think it's a, a kind of a stubborn concoction of attitudes it's pride. It's that voice that says, I don't need a rescuer. It's rebellion, that voice that says, I don't want a ruler or judge over me. It's idolatry. I prefer to think of God like this. So if we're going to avoid their mistake, and if we're going to have a heart that is receptive to receive God's rescuer in Jesus we need to do a couple of things. Firstly, we need to pray, don't we? Lord, my heart is naturally resistant to you. Please give me a soft heart. Please keep me from pride, from rebellion, from idolatry. My heart naturally goes to those places. Please keep me from those things. We need to pray like the hymn writer. Come, O fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing your grace. My heart is naturally out of tune with your rescue in your ways. You need to tune it. Let your goodness, like a fetter, like a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. I wonder, do you see your heart in those terms, prone to wander, out of tune, naturally hard, needing God to soften it? We need to ask God to soften our hearts so that we don't make their mistake. And we need to fight this concoction of attitudes. We need to fight our pride, reminding ourselves what they didn't know, that we need God's rescuer. We need Jesus. Just like Joseph's brothers would have starved if God hadn't raised up Joseph, so too we starve and we die spiritually unless Jesus rescues us. We need Jesus. Just like God's people would have stayed enslaved if God hadn't raised up Moses, so too we are enslaved to our sin unless Jesus rescues us. We need Jesus. And we need to fight our pride with such thoughts. We need to fight our pride. We need to fight our natural uh, rebellion in God's power. Remembering that God has made Jesus our judge and our ruler. That Jesus isn't some uh, fake who's trying to gain control over our lives. But that he is the one whom God has put in charge. 
raising him from the dead, seating him at God's right hand. He is our ruler and judge. God has made him our ruler and judge. We owe him obedience. So we need to fight our pride. We need Jesus. We need to fight our rebellion. Now, Jesus is Lord and rescuer and, uh, 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 and uh, ruler. And we need to fight our idolatry, remembering afresh God is not some genie in a bottle. He can't be contained in a space that we make. He's not some golden calf that we can mold and shape the way we want. He is the great, uncontainable God. He is who he is. Heaven is his throne room. The earth is his footstool. So let's be those who pray and ask God for his help. And use these thoughts to fight ourselves against pride and rebellion and idolatry. That we might receive Jesus and receive his rescue and his blessing. Let's pray and ask for God's help that he would be gracious to us in that way. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are the great uncontainable God, that you don't dwell in any one particular place, but that you have chosen to dwell with us, your people, wherever in the world we may be, that you are far, far too great and too big to be confined to one space. Help us think rightly of you, and help us too, Heavenly Father, not to be those who reject your rescuer, Would you please soften our hearts every day? Would you keep them from being calloused? Would we know that we need Jesus, that he is our ruler and judge, and that he is the great I am? He is God Almighty. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Keep us from hardness of heart. Grow us in grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.